Hello, it's your friendly neighborhood host, J.T. Wheatley, back for another episode of the History of Comic Books podcast, this time with part two of the history of King Features, the King of Comic Strips. When we last left off in the first episode, we detailed with the origin of King Features and the William Randolph Hearst, and how it came about to really setting up a new standard in comic strips, and this time we're continuing with the conclusion as King Features takes us into the modern day. Among the many other artists that King Features started signing around 1930s was Gene Einhorn, who joined King Features in 1936 after leaving the NEA and an annual salary of $35,000 a year, as King Features offered him double, once again continuing Hearst's uh, philosophy of hiring away the best talent at higher, at higher salaries. At King Features, Ahern created Room and Board, a, contra- a continuation of his boarding house strip that ran from 1921 to 1936 about life at a boarding house. Ahern would slightly change his characters from Major Hopple to Juggle Puffle, and, would run, and that strip would run to 1953. Right Around Home was a Sunday strip by Dudley Fisher that ran from ni- January 16, 1938 to May 2, 1965, about the energetic Myrtle and her parents, central figures in their neighborhood. What made this trip unique was that Fisher filled a single Sunday page with an elevated down, the, down view showcasing the characters in the setting. After World War II, the strip was renamed Myrtle Right Around Home and later Right Around Home with Myrtle. Fisher would draw it until his death, death on October 6, 1951 with his assistant Stan Randall, continuing the strip until finally ending it on May 2, 1965. With the success of Dick Tracy by Chester Gold in 1931 from the Tribune Syndicate, the crime comic strip launched into popularity and several syndicates moved to capitalize on it. For King Features, it produced Secret Agent X-9 by writer Dashiell Hammett, one of the greatest detective writers of all time, and artist Alex Raymond, appearing on January 22, 1934, the same year that Dashiell's classic The Thin Man was published. X-9 was an amalgam of many of Hammett's uh, characters before him, and clearly an FBI agent, though one whose method is then FBI director J. Edgar Hoover would never have approved of. To get the popular mystery writer, Hammett was paid $500 a week, with Alex Raymond as the artist get, just getting $20. Hammett would leave after a few stories, not able to keep up with the daily grind of a comic strip, but secret agent X-9 would continue till February 10th of 1996. That same year, King Features added another crime strip with Red Berry by Will Gold, no relation to Chester Gold, premiering on March of 1934 about an undercover cop working in Hollywood, lasting until July 17th of 1938, inspiring several books and a serial along the way. Another crime strip that came out the previous year was on August 7th, 1933, was Radio Patrol, about Sergeant Pat and his partner stuttering Sam. It was written by Eddie Sullivan and drawn by Charles Smith, originally appearing a year before as Pinkerton Jr., and would be noted for his realistic and serious stories, including accurate depictions of, Bo- of the Boston and New York New England areas. It ran until December 16, 1950, and would inspire several film serials and even an even outright movie. With the popularity of air travel, much of it spurred on by Charles Lindbergh's flight across the Atlantic in 1927, King Features launched flying strips like Ace Drummond in 1933, drawn by an actual World War I flyer Clayton Knight with legendary American flying ace Eddie Riddenbacher credited with writing it. The strip depicted the adventures of the title character around the world and at its peak was published in 135 newspapers before ending on July 7, 1939. In 1935, Barry Baxter in the air by Frank Miller, no relation to the uh, legendary comic book artist decades later, would also appear and was noted for his accurate depictions of airplanes. King Features also expanded in other avenues when it acquired the rights to the Lone Ranger strip, which launched on September of 1938 and ran until December of 1971. King of the Royal Mounted, launched on February 17th of 1935, based on writer Zane Gray's popular stories, and whose son Romer helped with the strip, about Canadian Mounties, and would run till February 14th of 1954. The big event, though, would be between 1934 and 1937, in which it would be one of the most important periods for King Features, and it essentially launched its big four strips in the 1930s. Flash Gordon, Mandrake the Magician, The Phantom, and Prince Valiant. Flash Gordon was created in response to the popularity of the science fiction series Buck Rogers in the 21st Century and created by Alex Raymond, launching on July 7th of 1934. 
Starring Flash Gordon, a Yale graduate and world-renowned polo player, along with the beautiful Dale Arden and the scientist Hans Zarkov, they find themselves on the planet Mongo after flying in a rocket ship Zarkov built in his backyard. There they da- battle the evil Emperor Ming, the Merciless, at the time of kind of a Fu Manchu of outer space. Don Moore, a popular pulp writer, will later provide scripts for the series, working until 1954 with Alex Raymond, and later his artistic successors Austin Briggs and Mac Webo. Alex Raymond's art truly grew on Flash Gordon, making him one of the best comic book strips in the world and cementing his place in comics history. Originally a Sunday strip, it became so popular that a daily was added in 1941, drawn by Austin Briggs, and lasted until 1944. Alex Lehman would leave the strip in 1944 to serve in the U.S. Marines during World War II, with the strip continuing under various artists to its end in 2003. Flash Gordon remains one of the most popular science fiction stories in history, inspiring numerous cartoons, TV shows, and movies, notably the camp classic 1980 film, while also inspiring many other stories in response. Most significantly, George Lucas originally wanted to do a film adaptation of Flash Gordon in the 1970s, but wasn't able to acquire the rights. Thus, he decided to craft his own science fiction saga, which we know today as Star Wars. During this time, Alex Raymond also worked on Jungle Jim about a jungle adventurer in the same vein as Tarzan, which launched on January 7, 1934. While not as popular as Flash Gordon, it was fairly successful, inspiring radio shows and film serials before ending on August 8th of 1954. Lee Falk pr- practically created the comic book strip her- superhero and thus the comic book superhero with both Mandrake the Magician and the Phantom. The first was launched on June 11th of 1934 about a magician with the power of hypnotism, thus the first with superpowers, which Phil Davis provided in the art. Together with his black companion, Lothar, Mandrake would set out on a series of adventures in science fiction and fantasy variety from strange parents and alternate dimensions while battling ro- everything from robots to werewolves. Mandrake's powers would also expand, demonstrating levitation, invisibility, teleportation, and shapeshifting. Lothar himself was quite powerful, said to be the strongest man in the world. He, li- he even lifted an elephant with one hand in the strip and invulnerable to any weapon forged by man. Also of note, Lothar is one of the first black superheroes depicted in comics. Mandrake would be highly successful lasting until July 6th of 2013 and inspiring numerous radio shows and serials along the way. Lee Falk next created The Phantom, which launched on February 17th, 1936, and he would be the first who wore a mask in the comic strip, thus fulfilling the other half of the equation, superpowers and mask. Inspired by such mass pulp heroes like The Shadow and The Phantom Detective, the strip chronicled The Phantom's adventures across Africa with the original art by Ray Moore. It was also here another distinctive superhero feature was introduced, that of a legacy character, as the role of The Phantom is carried on from father to son, earning him the, the name The Ghost That Walks, as many believe he cannot die, not realizing that the mantle has just been passed on from father to son, along with his distinctive purple costume and skull ring. The strip is still syndicated to this day and has, of course, inspired numerous films and TV shows. Of note is the underrated The Phantom 2040 cartoon of the 1990s and the fun uh, Phantom movie of 1996 with Billy Zane donning the purple suit and skull ring. Of special note, Flash Gordon, Mandrake, Lothar, and The Phantom teamed together in the Defenders of Earth cartoon series of 1985 in which they joined together to fight Ming the Merciless along with their children. Lasting for 65 episodes, it remains a cult favorite to this day, with some subtle progressive stances. For example, when it's believed that the Phantom is dead, his daughter takes up the mantle in the episode. Also of note, Stan Lee is credited with writing the lyrics to the title song. Was there anything Stan the Man Lee couldn't do? The final of King Features Big Four premiered on February 13th, 1937, when Hal Foster launched Prince Valiant, having previously done an acclaimed run on Tarzan. Tiring of that strip after so many years, William Randolph Hearst personally approached Foster about creating a new series, having long wanting to work produce a script with him. Originally, it was called Derek, Son of Dane, before being renamed to the more catchy Prince Valiant, and was supposed to be set during Arthurian times, but Foster actually set it several centuries later, which provided for more colorful costumes and pageantry for the strip. Hearst was so impressed by it that he gave Foster ownership of the strip and 50% of the profits, a rarity at the time. 
Foster would state Prince Valley was in the way in response to Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon, as they were going into the future, and he wanted to go into the past. Prince Valiant's debut was timely. It was right when King George VI of England was coronated, bringing the world's attention to kings and, and queens and all of their trappings. Foster would produce this strip until 1971 and still wrote for several years afterward before dying in 1982. During its run, Hal Foster would accrue numerous awards, winning the Rubin in 1957 from the National Cartoon Society for Cartoons of the Year and Best Story Strip in 1964, along with being inducted to the Royal Society of Arts in Great Britain, one of the few Americans ever honored. In fact, no less than the Duke of Windsor called Prince Valiant the greatest contribution to English literature in the last hundred years. Today, Prince Valiant remains a regular Sunday feature in newspaper strips, continuing the story of Prince Valiant the Thole and remaining a mix of history and fantasy. Like all entertainment mediums during World War II, comic books and comic strips joined in, and King Features was no exception. In 1943, Roy Crane was signed by King Features Syndicate, leading him to abandon his long-running Ross Tubbs Captain Easy feature. At King, he did Buzz Sawyer, which debuted on November 1st, 1943, about a Navy lieutenant, junior grade, serving on the carrier in the Pacific of World War II, one of the many war strips by King Features at the time. Sawyer was serving the military off and on for years, including the Korean and Vietnam Wars throughout the series before ending on October 7th of 1989. Frank Robbins did Johnny Hazard on June 5th, 1944, one day before D-Day, about an APA in the U.S. Army Air Corps, and after World War II ended, became a Cold War spy, lasting until August 20th, 1977. Meanwhile, superheroes, who originally made their debuts in comic books, started to get their strip, own strips in newspapers. Superman got his uh, own strip in 1939, with Batman following in 1945, published by McClure. Hoping to follow suit, King Features did Wonder Woman, which lasted from May 1st, 1944 to December 1st, 1945, and was only a daily. It did have the distinction of being written and drawn by Wonder Woman's creators William Moulton Marsden and H.G. Peter. Another innovation of comic strips at the time was the invention of the soap opera strip with Mary Worf in 1938 by Alan Sanders and the publisher syndicate. Realizing the potential of this new genre, Elliot Kaplan, the brother of Al Cap, the creator of Little Abner, created Dr. Biles for King Feature Syndicate. It was drawn by James McArdle from the pulp spicy detective about Stephen Bob and his drama as a hospital doctor. Alex Raymond did Rip Kirby after serving in the Marines in 1945, which debuted on March 4th of 1946, about a private eye. The initial idea was from the editor Walt Green. Unlike other detectives at the time, Kirby lived in an expansion Manhattan apartment complete with an English butler and, and also a reformed thief named Desmond. Raymond and Green stayed with the strip until 1956, and various artists continued it until the series ended on June 26th of 1999. With our cartoonists becoming more prominent, it was only natural they would form their own organization, the National Cartoonist Society. It was originally formed out of a group of cartoonists who worked together in the USO during World War II. Missing this fellowship, they decided to set up their own group, with original members being Rube Goldberg, Ernie Bushmiller, C.D. Russell, Gus Edson, Russell Patterson, Otto Soglo, and Milton Kniff. This formed the first committee on February 20, 1946, with Goldberg as president, Patterson as VP, C.D. Russell was secretary, and Kniff as treasurer. Sagalow would later become the second VP, and the Cartoon Society was officially formed on March 1st of 1946. Five out of the seven of these original members were, King, were signed with King Features, which was originally the Cartoon Society. National would be added a few years later. And King even helped provide the staff with Marge Duffy Devine. By 1947, the NCS would have 112 members, and eventually Devine would leave King Features to work full-time at the NCS, affectionately being called the Society's Den Mother. She continued to work at, at serve the NCS till her death in 1989, and is credited with helping to grow it in the organization it is today as the premier society for the, for the world's professional cartoonist. In 1947, King Features landed one of the comic strip superstars when it signed Milton Kniff away from Terry and the Pirates to produce Steve Canyon, which prepared on January 13, 1947. It was a signing so significant that it made the cover of Time Magazine in 1947 and Newsweek in 1950, and Kniff's deal allowed him to own the story with full editorial control. Kniff claimed to have personally met Hearst to make the deal, even stating Hearst said, You're a high-priced SOB, aren't you? Before walking out. The other claim is a story that, while not true, probably should be. 
Steve Canyon would last for four decades, becoming one of the top adventure strips of all time before ending on June 4th of 1988. Other big strips from King Feature Syndicate was Dick's Adventures in Dreamland by Mike's Trail and Neil 